and management of diabetes and hyperglycemia in patients with type 2 diabetes. This is an area that we have changed significantly in the last few years. In this presentation, I have to acknowledge that we have received, Emory University has received funding for investigator initiated studies from AstraZeneca and Descom during the past year. The agenda for this lecture includes what is the scope of the problem? Let's quickly review epidemiology, red glycemic target, why we should care about management of hyperglycemia in hospitalized patients. In addition, because most of you are clinicians, we're going to dedicate most of my time on the management to discuss insulin regimen, which and how to start. Non-insulin regimen, are they safe and effective? And how we should manage patients at the time of hospital discharge. And of course, some of you have been working on the research, discuss with you new areas of clinical research and technology. So let me bring you to the United States. And this slide to the left is the U.S. population with diabetes that have significantly increased during the past 20 to 30 years. Hello. I'm Guillermo Pierres. I'm a professor of medicine at Emory University of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, and the hyperglycemia in hospitalized patients. In addition, because most of you are clinicians, we're going to dedicate most of my time on the management to discuss insulin regimen, which and how to start. Non-insulin regimen, are they safe and effective? And how we should manage patients at the time of hospital discharge. And of course, some of you have been working on the research, discuss with you new areas of clinical research and technology. So let me bring you to the United States. And this slide to the left is the U.S. population with diabetes that have significantly increased during the past 20 to 30 years. We believe there are more than 34 million people with diabetes. And patients with diabetes are admitted to the hospital much more commonly than those with no diabetes. If you have somebody with pneumonia in the hospital and no, and somebody with pneumonia with no diabetes and with diabetes, of course, the patient with diabetes get admitted much more often. And we have close to 8 million hospital discharges every year with a known diagnosis of diabetes. There are 16 million emergency visits and the annual cost of diabetes care in this country is 327 billion. About 30% of the whole expense of diabetes care is in the inpatient. When we look at the, the prevalence of hyperglycemia in the hospital, let me present this data from the group of Curtis Cook Mayo Clinic in Arizona that they took 12 million blood glucose readings. The top is the ICU, and in the bottom is non ICU. And if you define hyperglycemia as a blood glucose greater than 180, you see that about 32%, so one out of three patients in the hospital that require finger sticks have elevated blood glucose. If you define as more than 200, it's one out of four. So hyperglycemia is very common. And we have learned for decades that diabetes and hyperglycemia is associated with an increased risk of cancer. What you have in here, is data from 3,200 non-cardiac surgery patients in the MRI system. Yellow is patients with diabetes. Red, patients with no diabetes. And those patients with diabetes that undergo general surgery at an increased risk of post-operative pneumonia, wound infection, sepsis, GI, acute myocardial infarction, and acute kidney injury, even death. So diabetes has a significant impact on alcohol. But it's not only in patients with diabetes. Let me present to you data that we published now a few years ago in about 11,000 patients that undergo colorectal and bariatric surgery. The left is patient with diabetes and to the right patient with diabetes and in red are those patients with the blood glucose greater than 180, in yellow less than 180. If we look at the left, 
Diabetes is associated with increased mortality and increased risk of infection, similar to what I presented to you before. But I want to call your attention to those patients with no diabetes who develop hyperglycemia, what we call breast hyperglycemia, in whom the hospital death, we have need for surgery, and the of infection is even larger than those patients with. So we don't know exactly why this is, but now we can say for sure that hyperglycemia is important, not only in patients with diabetes, but in all patients in the hospital, so it has significant impact on outcome. And this has led the Endocrine Society for many years, we wanted to have a blood group less than 140 before meals and, and a random less than 180. The last couple of years, the American Diabetes Association has relaxed the glucose target and what we want is to keep the blood glucose less than 180 for most patients with type 2 diabetes in hospital. So the recommendations would say is that insulin should be recommended and don't treat with oral agents. We know that this has changed significantly and many patients around the world are treated with oral agents. But let's review the data. So the current recommendations of the American Diabetes Association is that you should stop oral agents in most people and treat patients with basal or basal bolus regimen. And you give half basal, total daily dose, and half prandial insulin. So we divide this group of patients into two groups. First, patients coming to the hospital and they had not been on insulin before, or insulin naive, you start on 0.3 to 0.5 units per kilo. So you start in somewhere around 20 to 30 units you want to give 50% basal, 50% prandial. So 15 units of large in Deromir, Degludec, and 555 for the other. And we give the lower dose in those people, those patients that are elder, the older adults, or greater than 65, 70, and those who have a GFR less than six. When a patient comes to the hospital, and this patient had been on insulin before, recommend to reduce the dose of insulin but about 20 to 25 percent. Why? Because most people in the hospital with are needed are sick and they don't eat much. So to prevent hypoglycemia, you have to cut down the dose a little bit and then you can increase daily if needed. The recommendation to use basal bolus came from two studies that we call the rabbit medicine and rabbit surgery. This is the rabbit medicine. We divide patients to treat it with sliding scale in blue, is treated with basal bolus, 0.4 or 0.5 units per kilo of basal bolus, half basal, half bolus. And you see that if you treat patients with their medicine patient with light and scale, no glucose remain between 180 to 200 milligrams. If you treat them with basal bolus, markedly improve glycemic control. And in this study, we did not see differences in hypoglycemia. So it says, well, basal bolus, we prefer Side scale should be avoided at the single way of treatment patient with type 2 diabetes. Then we ask, well, bringing blood glucose is down is important, but can you prevent complications? And these rapid surgery patients compare, again, side scale uh, insulin versus basal bolus. Here to the left is a composite of hospital complications, and including wound infection, pneumonia, respiratory failure, acute kidney injury, and bacteremia. If you treat patients with sliding scale, surgical patients with admission blood glucose about 220 to 240, you have a three-fold increase in the rate of complications, particular when infection and acute kidney injury. So you don't only improve glycemic control, but you can prevent complications if you use basal bolus. That's what's the rationale of this recommendation from the Endocrine Society, the American Diabetes Association. What about human insulin? NPAs and regular, they are used all over the world. But you have to use insulin analog. We have done three studies. I re very briefly, I will present two of them. The first one is called the DEAN trial that compared Datamir with Aspar versus NPAs and regular. This is a three to target. The target was less than 140 before meals and a bedtime and in the morning. And you see that if you increase blood glucose, increase insulin, doses, you're going to go glucose in the same way. So no difference in glucose control. We also repeated the same study with glargin and glulysin. 
compared to MPH and regular. And if you do a three to target, so you increase MPH and regular, margin glycine, data mean of aspirin, you achieve the same glucose. But of course, if you use MPH twice a day, you're going to have an increased rate of hypoglycemia compared to the analogs. Here you have 25% versus 7.6% that develop hypoglycemia. So if you're going to use MPH, you're not going to target less than 140 fasting and pre meal. Maybe target less than 180. What about pre mixings? Many areas of this world, like Middle East, India, uh, Spain, Atlanta, Georgia, we have significant number of patients treated with 7030. Uh, and we did a study in the north part of Spain with Dr. Bellido, compared patients, medicine and surgical patients, and treated this with pre-mixed insulin versus basal bolus with margin and glulysine. And you will see here that the reduction in glucose control is very similar. But unfortunately, if you do pre-mixed insulin, the combination of NPH and regular is very stiff. That's why right. not, you cannot adjust. And the rate of hypoglycemia was significantly increased. The study was terminated early because more than 50% of our patients in Spain develop hypoglycemia compared to patients treated with basal ball. So again, if you're going to use 70, 30, you cannot target because less than 140 uh, fasting or a bedtime. There are several basal insulin, right? Now we have Levimir, Glargin, Deglutin. Glargin U100 is still the number one used in the United States, but we have now studies pairs with the others. At the other, better or worse than Glargin U100. So the first study compared Levimir to Glargin. This is over 6,000 patients with fine. So again, the recommendation is that you stop the oral agents and you start insulin. And you can, the current recommendation is that if you know if the patient is, if you don't know if the patient is going to eat, you're uncertain or it's going to be NPO like a surgery, you only have to give a single dose of bacon. So you start for most people 0.2 to 0.25 units per kilo. And you do correction, the blood glucose high, you give sliding scales. And we adjust the basal dose using 10, 20, 30% rule. Glucose in the high 100, you increase. 10%, the 200, you increase by 20%, the glucose in the 300, we increase by 30%, the daily dose of basal insulin. And if this is not enough, or the patient is eating well, well, you can do basal ball. Again, half basal, half bolus, starting at the dose of 0.45 units. So this recommendation came from a study that we call basal plus, that included 370 patients. There were medicine and surgical patients. And what you're seeing here is basal plus versus basal bolus. Absolutely no difference in glycemic control, bottom of this slice, blood glucose before meals and at bedtime. Again, no significant difference. So what we recommend, this is my favorite way I treat patients in the hospital. If that you start with basal alone, and if you need, you can progress to basal bolus. In patients with very high blood glucose, maybe require basal ball, and most people would just go with this. What about oral agents? So during the past few years, we have learned that in the United States, about 25% of patients are treated with oral agents. So all the government says, don't do it, but So we started thinking, what can we use? Metformin, I'm not sure, lactic acidosis, kidney failure, the DPP-4, maybe works. That's right. TCT is not good. So is hypoglycemia risk. And we have worked on the DPP-4 agents. As you know, they bring the blood glucose down fasting, but mainly in postprandial state. There are very little side effects. And we started doing these studies now eight or 10 years ago with the pilot studies. We took general medicine and surgery patients that we gave cetagliptin one daily. The lifting plus large in one daily for basal ball. When we reported in diabetes care, there was no significant difference. Hard to believe that's right. But the, the key is this if you have somebody with a glucose less than 180, the use of the glyptin alone here in, in, in dark run is equal to basal balls 
or acetic lifting with collagen. There was no difference. But if the blood glucose greater than 180, especially 200, 240, please don't use collagens because they're going to fail. So an alternative to have seroglyptin in patients with high blood glucose, we did a study comparing seroglyptin and basal, and basal bone. We call this study the CIRA hospital trial. And we do patient type 2 diabetes with a blood glucose between 140 and 400, treated with oral agents or insulin at a total daily dose less than four. Half of the patients were treated with seroglyptin plus collagen, and the other were treated with basal bolus regimen multiple daily injections. And what we reported now a couple of years ago is that the mean blood glucose, there's no difference. This is daily blood glucose to the left or glucose before meals and at bedtime. So theta plus margin equal to basal blood therapy. So we also said, well, what about other DPP4? And so we did a study that we call Lina surgery. Took 240 patients undergoing general surgery. We we're treated with oral agents or dosings, and we randomized to lina glyptin one tablet a day versus basal bolus. Both group received correction dose. And what we reported is that those patients treated with lina glyptin with or without correction with basal bolus was no difference in the CME control. So it can be used, that's right, but if there is a key. If you have a patient with glucose less than 200, the use of linagliptin resulted in a mean blood glucose similar to basal blood. But if the glucose was greater than 200, again, please don't use the uh, oral agents because they tend to fail. Of course, the patient has less than 200, the linagliptin was associated with less glycemic, less hyperglycemia and less hypoglycemia. So what about sliding scale? I know that for many, many years, we have said, please don't use sliding scale, but about 25 to 40% of patients around the world will treat it with sliding scales. So we recently entertained the question, when can you slide? When can you slew sliding scales? In? And we treat 25 patients in the MRI system, and we look at admission blood group. If you have a patient with glucose less than 140 or less than 180, the use of sliding scales alone was associated with fairly good glycemic control. Here you have the mean blood glucose was less than 140. About 80 to 90% of patients had a blood glucose less than 180. And that is the reason why people do versions on non diabetologists still sliding scales alone. Because it worked if they are mild hyperglycemic. But if the blood glucose greater than 180 or 250, people will. So the message to take home here is that you have to individualize care. You don't have to treat basal balls to everybody. And this is a paper we just published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. If you have a patient with mild hyperglycemia, less than 200, who had been on good control prior to admission with insulin naive, you can treat this patient with side scales or oral agent, DPP4, or the combination DPP4 with oral, uh, sliding scales. And they do very well. 80 to 90% of patients do very well. If you have a patient that already have been treated with low doses or have high, significant hyperglycemia in the 2 or 300, hypoglobin A1C 7.5 to 9, we recommend the use of basal, basal plus sliding scales or you can alternate basal with the. They do very well with this combination. As I show you, you don't have to give basal ball to everybody. We left basal ball for those patients are admitted with a complex regimen, high doses of insulin, with significant hyperglycemia, were very sick. So this is an interesting way that we are, now we recommend individualization of therapy in the hospitals. What about how we manage patients at discharge? So a few years ago with the Endocrine Society guidelines said, well, if the hemoglobin A1C is less than seven, but you should send home patients with the same dose of insulin, the same treatment that they came to the hospital. And then we said from seven to nine, we says increase therapy or add basal. 
we never say how much basal because we didn't know. And if it's more than 9%, we say send the patient home with basal ball. So this, we did a study to prove if the guidelines were correct. So less than seven, we sent home patients. Wherever they came, seven to nine, we gave 50% of the hospital dose. More than 9%, we gave 80%. And the primary outcome was reduction of hemoglobin A1C. And you will see here that it came down from 8.75 for 7.35. So having this protocol helped in reducing hemoglobin A1C. But what I'm showing here in the red box, red box is hypoglycemia. If you send home patients with oral agents and glargin with hemoglobin A1C 7 to 9, 30% develop hypoglycemia. And if you use basal bolus, 44. Why is that? Because there is no need to give insulin. No need to give insulin or send patients home, especially those insulin naive, if the hemoglobin A1C is 7 to 8%. We have changed our algorithm. And we don't start newly diagnosed patients or recently diagnosed or, or recently admitted patients or oral agents. That's the hemoglobin A1C is greater than eight. We send it home with 50% of basal. And if it's more than 10%, we get 80% of basal ball. But most people with less than 8% hemoglobin A1C, we just send them home wherever they came on. Of course, they can be maximized when they leave. So the thing that we have learned in the last few years is you don't have to give insulin to everybody at discharge. You can combine, like in this trial, metformin and sirogliptin, in the trial that we call sirogliptin discharge. And you see that most of these patients do very well with three months and six month therapy. Or you can use ELP1 at discharge. This is a paper that was just published last year. And you see that liraglutide versus glargin send home patients at discharge with randomized the regular type one daily or large and 100. There was a little more. So there is a nice relationship between hyperglycemia in patients with diabetes, patients with no diabetes with, with complications. But hyperglycemia is not the cause. It favor the appearance of complications, likely because it produces inflammation, oxidative stress, and the dysfunction. But we now know that having improvement of glycemic control decreased the rate of complication. Here you have the data from the rapid surgery that if you have a glucose, lower blood glucose in the basal bolus was associated with significant less, one third of the complications, especially wound infections, and acute kidney injury. The other thing is that you don't have to do basal bolus. You can do basal plus correction. 0.2, 0.25 units per kilo, more than enough. If you use MPH, you use 0.1 twice a day. And you see that compared to basal bolus, you have the same way. I presented data with oral agents. I have randomized control trials, and this is a, a composite of 640 patients, treated with DPP4 or DPP4 with basal or basal bolus. And the blood glucose is similar if the patient has a blood glucose less than. 182. And finally, I presented some interesting data. We're working very hard. Can we, can we stop doing finger sticks? Can the CGM replace one day finger sticks in the hospital? We don't know. We're working on that. But what I tell you is that you can have a better equalization uh, of blood glucose during the day during the night compared to point of testing that is not useful. And the use of CGM, this in the preliminary data that we have has been associated with lower rate of hypoglycemic events and time below range. One to know in large studies, this is the same with decreased comp. I want to first say, so much to learn. And second, thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you where we are in the management of inpatient hyperglycemia diabetes. Thanks a lot. Hello.